What's up everybody? Welcome back to Guitar Wishes and your Guitar Wish of the Day. This is Lee and I am once again standing in the middle of Guitar Wishes' beautiful downtown facility in Lincolnton, North Carolina. We're still open. A lot of stuff going on around here, but I wanted to show you a video I did just a couple of weeks ago. And if you were a fan of rock music back in the early 90s, you definitely know my next guest. Bass player for the band Firehouse up into the year 2000 and now the current bass player for Striper. Check it out. This is Perry Richardson. Enjoy this. We had a lot of fun. There he is. What's up? How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you awesome. Hear me? I'm doing good. How you doing? Man, I, you know what? I can't complain too much. You know, there's, there's so much going on in the world, I don't want to complain about minor stuff. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. Where are you at? <laughs> are you down in Myrtle Beach? Yeah, down in Myrtle Beach. Like, well, north of, up in Little River, in the north end. I love that area. My, every year, my family. Yeah down uh, around the little river area actually so really love that area yeah man yeah yeah uh, it's a little bit out of the way and you know out of the hustle and bustle of if you can call myrtle beach that i mean it's not that big of a place anyway right yeah we uh we like the brunswick golf plantation down there and so, yeah you know, we, uh, offers too. but um man i appreciate you joining us today thanks so much for uh for talking to us and uh, I've personally been a big fan for a long time, and uh, it's uh, it's an honor to talk to you, man. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be with you guys. Well, um, I'm from Guitar Wishes up in Lincolnton, North Carolina. Next time you're up in the Charlotte area, we'd love to have you out, man. Come, we got some really cool instruments up here. Uh, I love, yeah, I'd love to see it. But uh, I, I just want to start out. Let's just start from the beginning. I want to get to the Striper. I just talked to Michael Sweet uh, last week. And I, oh, did was, I was asking for uh, some Perry stories, and he said, "Well, I don't have any really Perry stories, except for uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get him to smoke um, shorter cigars before the show." <laughs> He's not gonna be good. No, that won't happen. <laughs> uh, <I> mean, <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to get him to light one up with me every now and then, but you know, he's worried about his voice. Oh yeah, well, you, but you know what? You're a heck of a singer yourself. You know, on my my things, I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and ask you. You know, in my opinion, you're one of the most underrated backing vocalists there are. You know, I put you in the category with Michael Anthony and Pat Badger from Extreme, Nuno Betancourt, those guys. You, know, you you truly do have uh, backing vocal chops, and you know, I feel like uh, vastly underrated. Well, thank you. I mean, that's what I started out uh, before I ever started playing. I was singing and I started singing in a gospel quartet when I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, you know, that's what draws me to uh, different bands is more the vocals than bass players. I mean, I was never, everybody asked me who my influences are and I really don't have any, you know, it's like, I was, my dad was, my biggest bass influence, I guess. But uh, right. yeah, it's always been a vocal thing for me, and I've always been into the harmonies, and and it's just uh, you know, where I come from. So right, and uh, you know, I I see that in you know, the writing that you've done too, you know. Uh, and we'll get to it again, uh, the the firehouse days. Um, but tell me about the the music scene down in Conway uh, when <laughs> you know getting ready and and learning your chops and. And uh, and finally hook it up with CJ. Tell me about the music scene down that way. Yeah, it was uh, back then. Myrtle Beach was pretty cool, man. There was a lot of a uh, lot of little clubs you could play. You know, it's, it's gotten a lot more corporate now, and not a, not as many mom and pop clubs that that bands can play. But back then, it was pretty good. You know, um, CJ they he had a band together up in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and they moved down here to try to get something going and they didn't have a bass player. So some friend of his and mine hooked, hooked us up and then uh, he came out to my house and they ended up, my dad ended up building us a rehearsal hall, man with a stage and all in it. And uh, he was such a cool man and uh, he helped a lot. Both of my parents, you know, if it hadn't been for them, I'd have never been able to do this. And uh, so I, Promised my mom I'd graduate from college before I went out on the road. So I did that. As soon as I graduated, we hit the road. Look, we'd put, we'd sat out there in that room and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed for like, I guess a, a year before we actually got a gig. So uh, as soon as I graduated, we 
we had out we had it out full time. Yeah. Just playing clubs, you know, seven, six, seven nights a week. Yeah, and and that area, the Myrtle Beach area, like you said at that time, there were a ton of places to play. Yeah, yeah. The Castaways has always been such a has a great place in my heart, man. That place was where I went, snuck in when I was a underage to go see some of my favorite bands that played there like n the only people around this area probably remember Rasmataz and sure. circus and jesse bolt and bands like that they just come played there and i and nantucket too was one of them and it was uh to get to play that place that was like the first gig i ever got was playing at the castle place and right right it, it was so cool, but the Magic Attic was there. Oh, um, dude, the Magic Attic was legendary. Yeah, yeah, the Electric Circus. There were some great places to play, and uh, e there was a place called Eagles. If you'll see all the Eagles Beachwear stores down here now, yeah. Before all that happened, they had a little nightclub that's called Eagles <laughs> Beef and Beer, I think, and they had a little T-shirt shop downstairs and a nightclub up top. And we played in out that one of our first gigs we played up there. Those guys ended up, you know, having a thousand beats for our stores. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's it was really cool back in those days. And now you know it's okay. uh, it's changed a lot. I'll have to say. Yeah, and, and as you, it, as it does everywhere. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Nantucket. You played with Nantucket for a while, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, in eighty. 80, end of 86 through 87 and part of 88, right before we got the firehouse thing going. Sure. So that was a great experience too. I mean, that, that really changed, opened my, opened me up to a different style of playing because that was such a, all that Nantucket stuff was recorded, all the bass stuff was recorded on a mini mode synthesizer. So they didn't have a bass player in the original band. My, uh, Mike Uzel played the bass lines on the keyboard. So yeah. it was a different way of thinking about playing. You know, I was never, I'd always been a metal guy and, sure. you know, <laughs> and then I started having to learn that stuff. It kind of opened me up to learn, you know, to different types of music. And it was a great experience for me though. Right. Um, and so now when you first started, say you're with Nantucket or when, when you and CJ uh, first started out, uh, what kind of gear were you playing back then? Uh, did you have a preference? Dude, I had a, the, I think the first bass I ever bought with my own money was a uh, Rickenbacker 4001. Sweet. Um, yeah, the, the bass I learned to play on, my dad had an old Kent that he played, playing around the house, but he ended up buying me a Gibson EBO, Cherrywood Gibson. Wow. That was my, real my first bass of my own. And, God, that was back in, man, probably 70, mid 70, 73, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wish I had that bass now. <laughs> but, uh, sure you um, yeah, but uh, I went, that, Rickenbacker was the first one I bought. And then I went through, I had a, went through, got a precision in the Max Warrior days. Mm -hmm. Even played a, even had one of those uh, Kramer headless Kramer Steinberger. Oh copies. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> boy, that thing's that was horrible. That thing <laughs> sounds so bad. But uh, the P bass was was cool. And then I got a Hamer, mm -hmm. one of those like Explorer looking body Hamers. I forgot what model that thing was. Um, God, until I got into Firehouse, the first bass company that. They actually, I was, I think I was one of the first people they ever endorsed was Roscoe Basses out of Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, they made me some great basses. They were in our first videos, beautiful, beautiful basses. And we got offered to go with, the whole band got offered to go with Yamaha. And they were going to take everybody, but everybody had to come with them. So I, had, I left Roscoe and uh, we all went with Yamaha. Mm -hmm. Full circle now two, well, three or four years ago, I got a message from Keith Roscoe wanting to come back and play their stuff. And oh. it's perfect timing. I was, I'd been a been a Spectre guy for a few years when I was with Trace Atkins and Craig Morgan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like, man, I'd love to come back. And 
I'm so glad I did. It's the best bass tone I've ever gotten. This new record we just recorded right. is just amazing. And they play so good. And Keith and everybody who works there, they've been over backers to help me out and rush these orders through for me. And it, they're a great company, man. And it's, I mean, the, one of the, I mean, the best sound of bass I've ever had. Yeah. Beyond compare. I mean, it That's gonna be blows on the- everything I've had away. Yep, yep. I'm gonna be on the new, and it's. I can't wait for it to come out. It sounds so good. <laughs> I'm so excited to be on this record. That uh, it turned out great. I mean, it's. Uh, it covers a pretty wide range of musical styles. I mean, you've got some really, really heavy stuff and a lot of groove stuff. Yeah. One lighter kind of, uh, not ballad, but a little lighter song was on there. But it turned out amazing. It sounds so good. We just got back to mastered version of it the other day, and I can't quit listening to it. Hell, <laughs> you know, it's so good. Are you are so. you your own worst critic? Yes, absolutely. I think everybody would be, but when you're a musician, man, you nitpick it to death. And you know, I'll, I've been listening to it now. It's like God. I wish I'd have done this there, this there. You know, but. When you're doing it, you know, I mean, it, there's some great stuff on there and it kind of comes from the heart and we didn't have a ton of time to sit there and spend, you know, rehearsing on it, you know. Okay. So we spent a couple of weeks rehearsing it out and then a couple of two or three weeks recording. And uh, yeah. but it's it's a great deal, man, I have to say. Did uh, did Michael produce that? Yeah. Did he? Now, how that boy's is good. <laughs> <laughs> He amazes me. His write his writing ability. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. He he can write a whole record in two weeks, man. It's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, music lyrics. I mean, I come up with a couple of titles for him. It's like I'll give you writing credit for it, man. Hey, you know, it's just a title. You don't have to do that. He's such a cool guy. All of them are great guys. Yeah. Um, that we put we went we went up to his house and. He sent us some just guitar riffs and a drum machine he programmed and so we could get familiar with the, the riffs and how they would go. And we got over there in a couple of weeks, just hashed it all out and arranged everything. And and uh, so I never did hear a finished product until I got like after we were done recording and he sent me a copy that he actually sang on Yeah. because I never heard the melodies and all they'd come up with. I'd mm-hmm. heard pieces of it, but... The only thing I knew is how the courses went because we recorded all the vocal uh, vocals in the courses when I was there. But right. it, when I got a copy of it, I was uh, blown away. I mean, I, it, you come up with some cool stuff, but then when it all comes together you, and you see how that vocal line's interacting with everything, and it was amazing. I was like, gosh, you know, is that just, it took it to a whole new level. Some really good stuff. Man, I'm excited to see it live too because um, you know Michael and I were talking about how well uh, new songs go over live for Striper. You know, it doesn't really hit for a lot of uh, a lot of bands uh, these days. New stuff, but Striper fans are always open to that, and that's a really cool thing. They, they are, dude. There's no other fans in the world like Striper fans. I've found that out, and uh, I always heard stories about them, and they're like, you. Uh, Get ready because you don't know what you're into in for because these fans are you like no other fan you've ever seen. And I was like, okay, yeah, they're amazing, dude. And I mean, there's uh, they, I mean, it they will they come to so many shows and they're so involved in the website and we have two or three different uh, Facebook pages that they're always on and always sending us messages and. Mm-hmm. And to and for them to uh, accept the new stuff because a lot of bands like Firehouse and you know all these bands that I mean they hadn't even put anything out new in years they right. just you know just kind of live on on the old stuff because of, most of the time that's what the fans want to hear is what you know love of a lifetime don't treat me bad and all that mm-hmm. it's not necessarily the case with Striper fans I mean they still love the old stuff but man. They're screaming for you know Yahweh and all the stuff that's on Fallen and all these newer albums that were out and it's 
so good that they do that. I mean, oh. it keeps it fresh for us. You don't have to play the same songs over and over that you, you know, that they've played for 35 years, you know? Right. Yeah. You know, uh, and speaking of live music, I have to ask you this. Um, 1991, one of uh, the best shows I personally have ever seen in my life, Warrant Trickster Firehouse, the Blood, Sweat, and Beers Tour. Do you remember that? Dude, dude that was – that was a – I mean, I was in uh, – that was the first big tour, dude. That was just – we were on top of the world. We thought we, you know, oh, my God, we made it. Finally, we made it. And, <laughs> Those things and, I've seen, man. It really was. I remember hearing where, uh, you know, Janie, um, again, great singer, gone too soon, um, where Janie yeah. and uh, and Brett from Poise, you know, they were going to tour. And then, you know, Janie said, well, hey, we'll go out and do our own tour. And he brought you guys and and, uh, and Trickster out. And I'll tell you what, to this day, one of the best shows I've ever seen. That was, man, and, and we've become good friends with them. And the, the Trickster guys, mm -hmm. so cool to, <laughs> just to get to know them. They're so crazy. They were, we had such a good time. It's like sharing music with each other that, that we'd grown up with and stuff. And they were totally different. They were, you know, New Jersey boys, and we were Carolinas. And it was night and day, but we just – we click and we become good friends with them. It was so cool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Janie was, uh, he was so amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so sad when he passed. Um, but he, uh, I mean, it was one of the, it was so funny when we were putting firehouse together, we got a band house in Charlotte mm -hmm. and they came through, I think they were playing with Brittany Fox, opening for Brittany Fox on a tour. And they played this club in Charlotte. And we went to see that show and we were just putting, we just part started putting firehouse together and they blew me away. It was one of the best sounding things. That blew, blew Britney Fox off the stage, man. It was so good. And I was like, why they end up and they ended up touring with those guys was a highlight because it was our first big tour. So that was some great memories, man. It was really cool. Yeah, those great times. And, uh, you know, speaking of Firehouse, um, an underrated album. And, you know, of course, the first one is a classic, and the second one was really good also. Uh, but the fifth one, you know, the the fifth yeah. album was so good. And, uh, you know, I know that you had some songwriting credits on there. Um, that didn't get the recognition it deserved. Either. Yeah. That, I, yeah, I opened up and started writing more for that record. I think I had – seven of the songs i pretty much writ, wrote them or was involved in seven of them and uh and even the uh did you ever hear the hidden track on there oh, of course <laughs> <laughs> that that one's pretty funny yeah anyway that yeah, was uh yeah i'd gotten tired of the same old you know hair band kind of thing and we'd mm -hmm. done that enough i thought and i wanted to to try to push the envelope a little bit and do a different style record and uh, you know I was kind of getting more into the country thing at the time and kind of a couple of the songs have a little country vibe to it I guess yes um, but I'm real proud of that record uh, that was that was one of my favorites yeah yeah and for anybody out there listening uh, check out uh, category five was uh, the name of that and, yeah, uh, and let that last let that last song run all the way through the end and for about a minute later something <laughs> you never heard a probably a little treat you're gonna pop up <laughs> <laughs> but, um yeah so then you want to uh you know and as you said you can start hearing a little bit of a, a country flavor coming out and then you went and uh started playing with craig morgan is that right yeah 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 i moved to nashville in 2001 and uh I I'd moved there. I wanted to put my own band together because when Firehouse first started, country in the ni early 90s, it was my favorite time of country in history. I mean, for me, I love that harmony thing and all these bands like Little Texas and Diamond Rio and Shenandoah, Restless Heart, and all these bands were just going crazy at country and actually became really close close friends with the guys in little texas and diamond rio and um 
it, it, that's what I wanted to do when I moved there. I wanted to put a band together, a group. And uh, I got a call one day. I was like, I hadn't done anything. I just got moved to town. I wasn't working yet. And uh, my best friend from Myrtle Beach was playing with Craig, Mike Rogers. And, and uh, he said, man, our Mon our monitor guy just quit. Could you come out and run monitors for us for a week till we can find somebody? <laughs> I was like, man, I never run monitors before, you know. Like, I can come out and whatever. I guess I'd be better than nothing. So, <laughs> so dude, I ended up doing that for like it got. I mean, it was like just keep, you know, kept doing it for a few months, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Ended up, put, they gave me a microphone. I was singing background vocals while I was running monitors <laughs> for him. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty funny. But, uh, and the ba bass player had to go to a wedding or something, and it was a last minute thing. And he's like, I gotta go. I can't, you know, I ain't got time to find a replacement. Y'all have to find one. Right. And Craig was like, oh God, what am I gonna do? It's like two days before the next show. I was like, well, I play bass. I'll, I could, I've heard the songs enough. I think I can follow along. He's like, really? You play bass too? I was like, he had no clue <laughs> who I was, right? <laughs> so, um, so I got up and played, just kind of, you know, felt my way through it. And uh, he was, he said, wow, that felt great. You want to play bass for me? So I was like, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll do it till I can get something else going. Ended up playing with him for like 14 years, <laughs> you know. And so it was just, uh, it was a good time. Well, I played with him for 10 or 11 years, and then I left and went to Trace Atkins for just about two years. Yeah. Didn't work out. I came, asked Craig if I could come back, and he's like, yeah. So I came back to Craig for a couple more years. And then I, then the striper thing fell in my lap, and I had to quit him again. So. <laughs> had to quit him twice, but he's, uh, he he forgive me and he said, ah, "This is a Christian group of young men. I don't mind you going to that." <laughs> That's cool. So, man. That was um, pretty funny. Yeah. So uh, you know, just such a storied career. Um, when you look back, um, do you have any particular instruments? that uh, you talked about the your, the uh, bass that your dad got you. Um, any particular instruments that have gone through your hands that you wish you had back? Yeah, that one. That <laughs> first Gibson EBO. Yeah, I don't care about that, Rick. I, that, no, I don't care about it. Um, the precision a little bit, maybe. It was like I said, I think it was a 73 or something like that. But that Gibson, I wish I had that back. Then the main reason is because my dad bought it for me, but you know, I don't know if it'd be worth that much, but it's just a, you know, a cinema. have a lot of sentimental value. Absolutely. You know, uh, what kind of rig were you playing through? Uh, it was a homemade cabinet thing, uh, that I got, a some guys in Raleigh build me and it was like a little, single 15 scoop like a little narrow little scoop and i had two of those and two boxes on top of those is like a 10 in it right and just had a like a i think it was a qsc power amp and a preamp kind of built my own rigs right. never used a like a base rig pretty much just kind of pieced one together right right how about now what are you playing through on the striper stuff now I'm endorsed by Peavy. Oh, yeah. And dude, dude it's, <laughs> I've always made fun of Peavy back in the day because that's all we ever could afford, right? And Max Warrior, I got a great Peavy story I'll tell you all okay. here one day. <laughs> but uh, just if it hadn't have been for Peavy back in the day, we'd have never been able to afford to have anything. Right. So thank God for him. But now, this thing, I mean, I've always been an Ampeg guy. Mm -hmm. It sounds as close to an Ampeg as anything I've ever heard. Maybe a little bit better. It's, I've got two of those micro amps that are like 2,000 watts a piece and two 810 cabinets. Uh, a pretty big pedal board this guy in Nashville built for me. And it's, uh, it's a great rig. 
sounds thunderous live. I mean, it's so good. Yeah. But it's the best rig I've had since back in the firehouse days when I had a wall of tube work stuff. But uh, <laughs> that, that was a gigantic rig. I think it was eight cabinets and six amps I had for that thing. Mm-hmm. It would move your pants legs in the front of a Coliseum stage, you know. Oh, I remember. But, yeah. 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 This this PV rig, it's amazing. It sounds great. That and the Roscoe together, it's, it's magical. Yeah. yeah. Uh, PV's great stuff. I, you know, I, I was on the road for a little while back in the late 2000s, and uh, PV actually endorsed me, and uh, they had some cool. really, really good stuff. And they uh, actually gave me a couple of bases, too. <laughs> And I enjoyed their bases uh, at that time and some really well built stuff. Man, we put, we put, I forget who it was, but we somebody opened for us when I was with Craig and was playing a PV. And that thing sounded so good out front. I, I actually went and asked him what it was because I couldn't see what it was. And that was a PV. I was like, wow, it sounded great. So they're making good bases too. Yeah, yeah they really stepped up. So that's, that's cool to hear. Uh, let me ask you about the quarantine and about the coronavirus and everything happening with that. Um, you know, musicians, they're stuck at home. A lot of the guys are, are uh, I've, I've talked to a few that are just kind of down and out and they don't really want to do anything. They're kind of depressed. Um, I, th- I think it's a great time uh, creatively. Um, are you sitting back? You ever work, have you ever worked on a solo thing? Uh, you ever considered it? I mean, it's a great time to start, start looking no. at something. No, no. I never considered that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. No, I've um, kind of like rattled around in my head to to do a an album that of my favorite songs growing up with. Mm-hmm. You know, like put a thing together like that, do a thing of cover songs, maybe one day. But no, not to do anything original. But uh, no, my wife's keeping me too busy. Is she? stuff around the house yeah <laughs> see she's over there going <laughs> but between her and the dogs man i don't get a minute off so i'm mean, I, I it hadn't changed a lot for us we are probably only usually only go to the grocery store and lowe's anyway right when i'm home <laughs> so, <laughs> we're not going out partying every night so we're not missing it much but uh well, we, you know we we love each other and love being around each other which helps and uh Oh yeah, it's uh, we're having fun. That's good, man. You know what? I'm I'm really excited uh, for music to come back in, live shows to come back in, and uh, I'm excited to see you on the road with Striper. And uh, you know, I think there's a date uh, scheduled for October around Charlotte somewhere. Um, And uh, you know, I'm really excited. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. I don't want to take up any more. I'm sure your wife's got something no. for you to do um so. we got a you had a full day actually yeah <laughs> uh brothers uh thank you so much for your time today it's been an honor and uh, i've been listening to you for a long time and thank you very very much oh man thank you it's an honor to be with you i can't wait to see you on the road i'm ready sweet man and uh again for everybody here at guitar wishes we'd love to have you in if you're in charlotte we'll send the car pick you up got it and- what a great time we had with Perry. Thank him so much for his time and willingness to come on and share some of those great stories with us. Talk about the new Striper album. If you have not heard the new Striper album, you've got to check that out. He does some great playing on that. And go check out the old Firehouse stuff. Pre-2000, again, is where you'll hear Perry playing bass, uh, the Cigar Aficionado. So we had uh, quite, a, quite a talk about cigars. And uh, Perry, if you're watching this, thank you again so much. And enjoy that cigar you're smoking. So uh, we'll talk to you soon. If you want to know more about Guitar Wishes, check us out on guitarwishes.com. Check out our Facebook site. And of course, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cruising for a bruising.